Imagine a landscape under the sea, with mountains, valleys, canyons, and plains. For most of our history, it was thought that the vast majority of our blue planet was flat and featureless, much like a desert of water. We know now, though, of course, that deserts are rich in life and character,、um, and they just have this great disguise brought on by a harsh environment. Well, what lies beneath the ocean is very much the same. It's full of Beautiful secrets that cannot be imaged from space, using remote sensing techniques generally used to map terrestrial features nowadays.、And、the reason for this is that electromagnetic waves become highly attenuated when they travel through seawater. As such, in order to map the seabed, we mount sensors on boats, steam up and down, and we call it mowing the lawn to illuminate and record what is there. For sure. Continental shelves, when they are submerged, look very different to their equivalent onshore topographies. So think of coral reefs, tidal currents that shift sediments around, and all the organisms that occupy almost every inch of benthic habitat on the seabed. But frozen in time as well are riverbeds, lakes, lagoons, caves, and cliffs. So the notion of an Atlantis is really everywhere, all over the global continental margins, exposed several times over with shifting sea levels linked to glacial interglacial cycles. The real impact of these specific places, though, is where ancient human populations are involved. With sophisticated technology, we can use hydroacoustic methods to see through the water column. How we have understood. Broad changes in the Earth's climates, environments, and continental configurations have basically been, first and foremost, based on maps of the seafloor. Fortunately, water is a beautiful medium for sound waves to travel through, and in marine geophysics, sonar is our superpower. Generally, depending on the properties of the water, sound travels about five times faster than it does through air. It still remains that we have better maps of the Moon, Mars, Venus, and Jupiter than we do of our own Earth's seafloor. But thankfully, high-resolution surveys are increasing, and、uh, methods are advancing hugely. As of 2021, we are in the United Nations decade of ocean science, which is testament to the many marine scientists who came before and brought awareness to the importance of the ocean floor. This is Cape Saint Blaise in Mossel Bay, very close to the southernmost tip of the African continent right now, where sea level is at the moment. I took this photo on a pretty rare day when the high-energy waves were not crashing against the cliffs and the turbidity had settled, allowing a sneak peek into this little sliver of seafloor below. What you will notice is that the base of the cliffs is in fact under the sea; it's just blanketed by some marine sand right now. What I'm going to get back to a little bit later is that on the seabed there are definitely similarities to what we're familiar with under our feet right now, but also some stark contrasts. Taking a quick fly through some of our geophysical data from the seafloor of Cape Saint Blaise, the blue is the water level, the grey scale is the onshore topography and the offshore structures, and I just want to demonstrate the seamlessness of this environment. We're floating 20 meters above the seabed. Sometimes dipping below the water and sometimes above, but I just want to show you that that is a very movable baseline. Zooming out a little bit onto the coast that we're all familiar with and the shape of the shoreline that we know today, when we start to sort of erase the sea or see through the water, one of those stark contrasts that I mentioned earlier comes to light, and this is that the hard quartzite folded rocks of the Cape Fold Belt Mountains. Do not extend very far onto the continental shelf at all on the Cape South Coast. In fact, the coast is bordered quite closely by a sweeping continental shelf, known in marine terms as the Agulhas Bank. And this underpins what I want to talk to you about today. Sea level is certainly not static. Globally, sea levels have shifted between a height of about 10 meters above present level and about 130 meters below present level. Every hundred thousand years or so, over the last few hundred thousand years, 
So this, this continental shelf and coastal plain are very linked, and the emergent and submerged portions are just depending on where relative sea level sits at any time. In southern Africa, these, our paleo landscapes therefore have waxed and waned over the millennia, and for 90, 90 percent of the time that our genus Homo has been around, sea level has been lower than what it is today, exposing these landscapes that contain food resources and plants and animals, everything you imagine on shore at the moment. What I want to talk to you about today is how we've. Mapped and described an extinct terrestrial landscape and ecosystem under the water on the Cape South Coast. When in the Agulhas Bank is exposed as a landscape, we refer to it as the Paleo-Agulhas Plain. This approximately 85,000 square kilometer area, which is nestled between rocky shelves to the west and rocky shelves to the east, was pretty much a completely different environment to what we have in this area now. The Paleo-Agulhas Plain lies south of the Cape Floristic region, which is a pretty remarkable area for plant biodiversity and endemism. In addition to the Cape Floristic region's vegetation richness, it's also famous for having the oldest cognitive and social evolutionary history of Homo sapiens, documented from archaeological sites scattered along this Cape South Coast near coast, the coast right now. And these records are contained in caves that face onto this Paleo-Agulhas Plain. Twelve years ago,、um, in 2009, I met three paleoanthropologists and archaeologists called Curtis Marion, Eric Fisher, and Kyle Brown. And this interaction changed, sort of, it initiated this work for me, and it kind of changed the way I was thinking at the time. So they had been working at Pinnacle Point. Which is an archaeological site along the cliffs from Cape Saint Blaise, just six kilometres to the west, very close to Mussel Bay. And in these caves, they'd unearthed records that went back almost 200,000 years, documenting human behavioural change through time. What they found quite profoundly was that the, there was a very intense use of the coast by the people that were occupying these caves through time. And interestingly, the records were. Sort of, they fluctuated from high-intensity occupations when the coast was close, and then people left the sites for lengthy periods of time, clearly tracking the shoreline down the receding shore onto what's now under the water. We've kind of tried to reconstruct this landscape, especially to contextualise this anthropogenic angle of it all. I want to also quickly take a step back and stress two important things, which are space and time. So you may well have grappled with the ideas of、um, of space and certainly of geological time, and in case you haven't, just to sort of put some things into context, if you imagine the 4.3 billion years, which is about the age of the Earth, transposed onto a 24-hour clock, the arrival of、um, of hominins, which is the last several million years, takes place at one second to midnight, literally the blink of an eye. So the geological record has remarkable stories we can tell from the rocks. Most geological deposits can be dated, and with dates you can calculate rates, and these rates indicate this change that happens in this vast geological time. I also want to note that the Earth is pretty much like a large recycling machine, and everything is redist- redistributed and redeposited, eroded and reforming. It's a very、um, interesting cyclic process. So, zooming into Mussel Bay now, we mapped out there with、um, hydroacoustic sensors that can see what the human eye cannot.、Um, you can see on the grayscale image behind me that the Cape Saint Blaise caves and cliffs under the water where we flew through earlier, and then over to the east, off the Great Brack River, there's a remarkable record of paleo coastlines through time, which have tracked this change of sea level through time. You can see beautifully the channel of the river carved onto the seabed, and these coastlines that flank this river channel. These have documented sea level change over the last 140,000 years in almost a continuous、um, record of, of deposition, which we thought was pretty incredible to find. We dived out there extensively to sample these rocks, to work on them and analyse them, and have them dated. Um, and some of the images on the left show you what it looks like under the water in the middle of the Bay of Mussel Bay. 
A lot of these reefs were previously uncharted, and certainly not, probably hadn't been dived on.、Um, and many of you will know that Mussel Bay is probably more famous for its great white shark population than for dive spots in the middle of the bay. So we faced some interesting <laughs> challenges, but all was well. Broadly, the, what we saw from the geophysical mapping is that it's generally this kind of a flat landscape, which is what we expected on the Agulhas Bank. But there are these little pockets of beautiful preservation, in fact, very fortuitously preserved rocks and features on the seabed. Ultimately, pulling this together with other geophysical data sets、um, and drawing on legacy data too, we were able to construct a geological map of the last glacial maximum for the Paleoagulhas Plain. So this is a snapshot of what we anticipate the landscape was likely like 20,000 years ago, when sea level was 130 meters lower and the coast was at least 100 kilometers away from where it is now. From the geological basis and from samples from cores that we analysed, we were able to extract elements of soils from this landscape too, and create what a projected soil map for the Paleoagulhas Plain. Certainly. Well, the enigma of things under the water is that you've got to imagine them not being under the water. So imagine soils that require a certain amount of time to form and develop. Imagine the vegetation that needs to take hold onto those soils, and then these unique vegetation areas support plant and animal resources that make this landscape quite unique. I'm going to start ending off with a series of.、Um, Drawings and paintings. So I used watercolors and pens to try and visually show you what we think about this paleo landscape, and from all the reconstructions that we've done over the last decade. So starting with the digital elevation model, with the landscape forms and features and shapes, going onshore to offshore during the last glacial maximum, with 130 meters lower sea level, and like I said earlier, a distance of at least 100 kilometers out. We have one small analog remaining right now of this much broader Paleoagulhas Plain. So this is the Agulhas Plain that's illuminated in colour over here, which is nestled between the mountains and the coast of Cape Agulhas. It's about 70 square kilometres of relatively marshy wetland, grassland kind of terrain, and we think that this is the last small snippet remaining of this much broader landscape, which is in fact about the size of the country of Ireland. That lies out adjacent to the Isagalas Plain, now of course submerged by high seas. If you were to dive on this landscape, you certainly wouldn't find dead trees, for example, because these things were alive 20,000 years ago, and they've been rapidly drowned with the rise in sea level. But what you do find are small remnants of information that we can use to piece together much larger pictures of a story. We find sediments that contain pollen, wood fragments, charcoal—all this evidence of what may have been there in the past. Taking the next step in this reconstruction, we now see the landscape as we know it above the water, plus the Paleoagulhas Plain below the water. And I want to point out a few features that were remarkably different. So, firstly, the Paleoagulhas Plain, because of its topography and its underlying geology. Had a completely different composition to the Cape Fold Belt mountain area. So we we anticipate that from these clay-rich soils there would have been grasslands,、um, there would have been sizable floodplains that we've mapped out with seismic or sub-bottom profiling data, such as that kind of slice of a cake down through the side that I've shown behind me. We've seen that the rivers behave completely differently when they hit this landscape compared to what we know now on the Cape South Coast. So grasslands and floodplains and wetlands, a soft and highly dynamic coast that was shifting in response to these changing sea levels. And if you imagine putting a marker across this, this topography and sliding it up and down, all the features we know from the coastal plain today migrate out and back across the landscape. So the, the Paleoagulhas Plain was. We believe a lot more fertile compared to the relatively impoverished soils of the present-day Cape Fold Belt. We understand now how these human populations were well supported through the glacial periods in the southern area of South Africa, compared to some other parts of the world which were much harder hit by the Ice Age times. People would have had 
ungulates to hunt, there would have been migrating animals across this ecosystem, supported by these rich grasslands. And of course, a coastal resource from this shifting coast, because it's a highly productive coastline where the mixing of the agulhas and benguela currents takes place. In addition, if you drop sea level, you imagine the the closeness to the agulhas current would give an ameliorating climate influence to make it a little bit more tolerable to survive through these glacial periods. Even though we had no ice here, it was colder, possibly more arid, although we're not too sure,、um, and certainly a different place. So previously, I was dropping sea level to expose the secrets below, but now I'm starting to. We need to do the opposite. Um, taking into cognizance that we are living through the post-glacial marine transgression or this rise of sea level as it is at present, what we found out there on this landscape was a time in history when sea level was rising extremely fast, probably four to five times faster than what it is rising now. We've seen this from geological evidence next to the Great Black River, as these beach and dune deposits rapidly overstepped in a landward direction. Indicating a very rapid rise. From calculating those rates of change, we believe that people living on this coast would have witnessed a loss of a landscape in a lifetime. Moving forward, and having been equipped with the lessons from the past, I start to wonder: To what extent can we use science in real time to solve problems? How can we better adapt our behaviours to effectively live on this planet? And to what extent can science form part of these adaptation tools? Of relevance to people right now, we are of course in a period of warming, and sea level rise is a certain consequence of that. Ecosystems will change. We use the past to inform the future. I kind of I want to end off with just a thought that that encapsulates some of the context that we we've discussed through this presentation. And that, as we think forward, in order to better project the future and understand the present, we have to keep this context of the past in mind. So, the space and time and the elasticity of of these things is certainly something to keep in mind. Thank you.